Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Racer's Edge, episode four, live from Lockdown London. Thanks for all your support so far. Got a great show, I hope, uh, in store today. In the week that we lost one of the all-time greats, Sir Sterling Moss, long, long battle against illness over the last couple of years. What a fighter he is. He had maybe the biggest shunt of his career when he fell down a lift shaft in his house a few years ago, bigger than anything he had in a Lotus 18 at Spa in 1960 or even at Goodwood in 62. Um, but there he is, there he was fighting right to the end. And um, we wish Lady Susie, his wife and all his family, all the best, a big hug to them all. It's been a really, really tough time for everybody, but um, we'll be remembering Sir Sterling in this show with a few, with a bit of video from AP Archive, courtesy of AP Archive. Big thanks to them as well. On a happier note, happy birthday to Sir Frank Williams, very good friend of mine, very good team principal too, actually, bit of success along the way. And also to Kurt Ahrens, a very, very quick German driver. Well, never realized his birthday is on the same day as Sir Frank, but um, Kurt Ahrens, a driver quite close to my heart because he did a TV show with Jim Clark uh, the night before the Hockenheim race in 68, when sadly Jimmy lost his life the next day. So I um, hope to be talking to Kurt at some point this year on Skype, I think, if we can get him. Uh, so happy birthday to Kurt. And of course, to Sir Frank. There'll be a few Sir Frank chats, uh, no doubt, as the show progresses, and I'll have a few memories that I'd like to share with you as well. Uh, but to kick off, just to kind of continue the theme of e-racing and where we left off in the last episode, interesting that quite a lot of comments on the YouTube channel from people saying they kind of agreed with me. And, and, and isn't, it, isn't it a shame that we're not seeing more of the drivers close up and personal when they're doing this, the hands, the fingers, the eyes, the eyelashes, the blinking? the shoes, the footwork. And and I was hoping that when Red Bull got hold of it with Max Verstappen doing a couple of Aussie V8 races, at weird circuits like Barcelona uh, this week, that it would be slightly different because Red Bull are very, very polished in the way they go about their media stuff. Um, but actually it was more of the same really. Lots of, it looked really good on track and it, they tried to make it look like uh, as normal a race as possible. It was an interview with Max beforehand, but we didn't cut back to seeing what they were actually doing with the steering and the throttle. We had Max at one point said something like, I haven't got used to blipping the throttle, which nobody took him up on that. But what I assume he meant was the downshift blip and he hadn't got that done. So he had it on auto blip. And But that would have been something really interesting, I think, to have talked about and to have had a look at that whole blipping business. Anyway, they didn't. So that's kind of it for me, I think, on this e-racing. If Red Bull aren't going to get it and F1 don't seem to get it, then I think I'll just wait until we have normal racing again. Uh, I know that's just me talking, but uh, actually I know over in America, Anthony Joseph Foyt has kind of expressed the same view about uh, virtual IndyCar racing as well. But we won't go into all the um, expletives that he used in describing it. So there was that. And um, we've also really, we've got some questions coming in. I've just got to thank David Myers, one off, for just saying... Um, we might get the answers we've been looking for. Is all this encyclopedic knowledge stored in the proverbial hard drive, Peter? Well, I think that's a compliment, but anyway, I hope so. Obviously, like everybody, I make mistakes and don't always get it right. I know I have my own opinion, which uh, many of you, I'm sure, will disagree with forevermore. But nonetheless, it is what it is, and I love my sport. We have had um, we had a very good question actually from uh, Jimmy Roberts, who's the new editor in chief, probably is the right title of the new official F1 magazine. Really, really nice publication. Um, and he he was watching last week's show, and I mentioned Toto Roche, the French starter. Uh, rotund gentleman, looked very like Alfred Neubauer, actually, from a distance, the Mercedes, famous Mercedes team principal. Um, and he said, tell us more about this Toto Roche. So I've been having to think about that, Jimmy. And Toto Roche, actually, I don't know that much about his background. I don't think he ever raced. I think he was always a sort of, um, I think he was always a, uh, it's my mum just trying to ring me. I'll ring her back uh, at the end of the show. Um, I think he was always a French motor racing official. So he was, the, he was the race director of the French Grand Prix and he was official starter and the official finisher, sort of, you know, Charlie Whiting of the early days. The first Toto, you've got to say, it's spelt the same way, T-O-T-O. -T -O. 
Uh, and he was notorious throughout Formula One in his period because he was had this ridiculous um, view that he could never get hurt regardless of what he did. This sort of Churchillian thing of standing on top of the buildings watching the blitz. It was the same thing with Toto. He would stand in the front of the grid, literally in front of the front row, with the starting flag, the French tricolore, um, down by his side. And his trick was to try to catch all the drivers by surprise. So they'd be watching for the first twitch of his wrist and he'd walk there with the flag and he'd suddenly go like that and just drop it and run. Uh, and this became his, his signature. He never actually was hit, but um, he did cause chaos from year to year. Um, a few inst instances that I can remember. One was um, actually Nigel Roebuck reminded me of this. 57 Morocco Grand Prix, which was the non-championship race before they held 58 championship finale in uh, Casablanca. And um, he was clerk of the course there or race director because, of course, it was part of France in effect. So he was doing that over there. And it was a funny race, actually. It's kind of topical for today because there was a, a very, very bad virus that weekend. And a number of drivers were badly hit by it, including Sterling Moss, who decided not to race and flew home and actually got a lot of flack from the British press, would you believe, for being a wimp. Uh, Fangio got the virus mildly, but raced and finished a sort of detuned fourth. But the race was won by Jean Berra, which I guess why Nigel Roebuck remembers it, of course. Anyway, during the course of the race, the back end of the race, uh, Rob Walker, who was running a Cooper Climax for Jack Brabham, as he did periodically at these non-championship races instead of the works car, um, there was oil coming out the back of Jack's car and smoke. And Neubauer, uh, sorry, Neubauer, there you go. There's a Freudian slip for you. Roche came up to Rob Walker in the pits and said something along the lines of, we are going to have to stop uh, Jack Pravam. And um, Rob said, oh, well, you know, I think there's so few laps to go and I can't really see any oil at the moment. And he, and he made sure that whenever Jack came past the pits, that he was talking to Toto about something very annoying from Toto's perspective. And sure enough, the race ran out with Toto eventually not getting around to black flagging Jack and Jack crossing the line and getting some uh, getting some prize money, I guess. And then oddly penalizing Fangio after the race, the wrong guy. And Fangio took it all in quite good spirit. So um, he was definitely a guy you could hoodwink because his ego was so big. So that was 57. And then uh, he, he, in 59 French Grand Prix, again, it involved Jean Berra, was at Reims. He, um, he was so slow at getting out of the way of the front of the grid that Berra, who had let the clutch out, had to brake and then stalled the car, the Ferrari, factory Ferrari he was in, and effectively then had to drive through the field, revving the engine like crazy to the point where the engine blew. And he then had a big punch up with the Ferrari management because of that engine problem, was fired by Ferrari. And of course, he died shortly afterwards at Arvis in 59. Um, so you could trace that whole Jean Berra drama to Toto Roche's starting system. Um, 60 was, the, was another French Grand Prix at Reims, again, long straights, very quick, but it was a walkover win for Jack Brabham in the rear engine Cooper. And he was so quick and it was so um, trouble free and it was such a good win for Jack that Toto never got around to putting the checkered flag out. And Jack just pulled into the pits when they knew the race was over and that was that. No checkered flag at all in the 60 French Grand Prix. Um, and then, of course, a 63 race again at Reims. There was a drama with Graham Hill, who was the reigning world champion on the front row in the BRM, he had a had an engine problem. They couldn't, and I think it was a fuel vapor lock thing. And they were on the grid, they couldn't get the engine started. And so Toto just delayed the start because the world champion had to be in the race. And so they just, he just right, delayed the start, allowed the mechanics to push start Graham's car, which was actually illegal in those days. You weren't allowed to touch the car, only the driver could touch the car. And um, they waited for the engine to burst into life, which it did. And then he started the race with the red flag he'd been holding instead of the tricolor. He'd had the red flag in the other hand. So he actually started the race with a red flag. Um, 66 French Grand Prix again at Reims. They're all at Reims, really. I mean, no doubt there was, oh, there was an incident at Rouen as well in 62 when uh, at the end of the race, it wasn't really Roche's fault, but the crowd swarmed onto the track 
uh, when Dan Gurney won in the Porsche, and there was a massive shunt involving Trantignon, uh, and Trevor Taylor, I think it was, had a, they, the crowd, just to avoid the crowd. Nobody was actually hurt or injured, but it was a horrendous situation, which really Toto Rosh should have controlled. Uh, and then 66, French Grand Prix, again, going back to Raz, Jack Brabham, when he won there. Um, that race also was one where Toto was in the middle third of the grid, I guess, when he dropped the flag. And there were a lot of cars coming around. I think Chris Amon comes out in the Cooper and almost hits Toto's accelerating through. He's in second gear by the time he's about two inches away from Toto's leg. So anyway, that was Toto Rosh. Um, we also had a nice question in from uh, Diego in Madrid again. He's saying, um, given that April 11, my birthday actually, marked another anniversary of Ayrton Senna's great win at Donington in 93, in your opinion, what was the greatest exhibition qualifying drive victory in the wet by any driver in the history of the sport? Well, if we got seven and a half, 10, 15 hours, we can answer that. Um, you know, I don't know. I love racing in the wet and there are so many examples of great drives in the wet, some of which didn't result in, in wins, of course. And I think those should never be discounted when we're talking about great weather, wet weather performances. Equally, I think you always have to look at races where everybody was on the same tyres because sometimes the Dunlops were better than the Firestones or the Goodyears. And, you know, that has to be taken into account as well. But there have been, I don't know, I'm obviously, you know, you can't compare the eras in any rational way. But if you think back to, I don't know, 61 British Grand Prix at Aintree, you've got to say Taffy Von Trips did a pretty good job in the wet that day. Um, but then again, Tony Brooks set fastest lap in that race. Yeah, right at the back end of his career when people didn't really rate him anymore. He was in an uncompetitive car at that point. But he set fastest lap. It was wet. And suddenly Tony Brooks came alive. And that was, um, you know, that should never be forgotten, I think, about Tony. Who's fit and well, i got to say. I was talking to him quite recently. And... Um, you know, very sad that a couple of years ago at the Autosport function, um, Tony Brooks, John Surtees and Sterling Moss were all sitting together. And I was shocked that the guy doing the interviews, not Henry Hope Frost, walked straight past them to ask some question of a British touring car driver who was sitting two tables away or whatever. And these three guys never got to be, we never got to hear them speak at all, just three of them. Of course, that'll never happen again. And what a what a sad thing that was. Anyway, that's just in passing. But, um, you know, I, I don't want to do the whole show on wet, wet drives, Diego, you know, thanks for asking the question. But, you know, some spring to mind, 62 German Grand Prix, Graham Hill, superb, but the driver of the race, in my view, that day was Dan Gurney. He was on the pole in the Porsche. It was wet. And he didn't win it, really, because the battery mounting came loose in that flat eight Porsche, air-cooled Porsche. And he was having to wedge the battery stationary, basically, with his left leg, driving around the Nürburgring, uh, knowing that any spark could trigger a fire because he's just surrounded in fuel tank. And he still finished third in that race in the wet. To me, that was one of the great all-time drives, let alone drives in the wet. That was just a brilliant performance from Daniel Sexton Gurney. Um, 63, I mean, Jim Clark had some great races in the wet. I know you're going to say, oh, yeah, there goes Peter with Jimmy. But I mean, 63, Belgian Grand Prix in the wet. The, the, it was so wet towards the end of the race when Chapman and other team owners were, were pleading with the organisers to stop the race. The water was bouncing, John Cooper... The border was bouncing a meter up from the road. The rain was falling so hard, but they didn't stop it. And Jimmy had to do the full race distance in that Grand Prix, the 63 Belgian Grand Prix. And he had to do the full race distance holding the car in top gear going through the master kink because it started to jump out of gear as that Colotti gearbox did quite regularly. And he went through, he dropped like 300 revs in general, but he went through holding the steering wheel near the bottom of the wheel, knowing that every lap the car was gonna have 150 mile an hour slide through the master kink while he's holding it in gear with the right hand. And he needed to have steering wheel leverage to be able to control the opposite lock slides through the master kink. And he won that race by a lap. Effectively, I think Bruce McLaren unlapped himself right at the end, but Jimmy won that race by a lap. I mean, in terms of wet weather wins, doesn't come any better than that, in my view. 
65 as well, of course, Jimmy won in, uh, at Spa. Uh, so dominant towards the end. He was worried about his compatriot, Jackie Stewart, who was in his first season of Formula One and was slowing down, trying to control Jackie's pace because he knew how dangerous it was at Spa in the wet. And that's how, how good Jimmy was, how on top of the game Jimmy was in the wet. Um, an incredible performance from him. 66, you know, I was talking to John Judd the other day, who's still fit and well and great guy. And he was an instrumental part of the whole Brabham Repco program, working on the Repco engine. I knew Jack really, really well. And he said that Jack always felt that his win at Nürburgring in 66 in the wet was his greatest Grand Prix win. And who can dispute that? I mean, it doesn't get a lot of focus, a lot of coverage, but to me, that was, again, a consummate performance. Do we ever think of Jack Brabham as a wet weather driver? There's your, there's your answer. Absolutely brilliant. Um, you know, it can go on. Jackie X, Rouen 68 in the wet, you know, still basically a young rookie in Formula One, certainly his first year at Ferrari to win that French Grand Prix. Um, you know, modern... Let's do more in the next show because I don't want to talk too much about that. We've got up to the 68... French Grand Prix. And I think Diego's got one other rider question, actually, which was quite an interesting one. Um, he says, uh, what other drive... Uh, he said, um, yesterday, I guess that was yesterday, the Formula One YouTube channel, it's the official one, showed the, 60, the 96 Spanish Grand Prix, which was a masterclass drive in the wet by Michael Schumacher. Absolutely. In a year when it was difficult for Ferrari against Williams, he won at Spa also. But this was a win that kind of kept it on track for Michael. And he says, what a spectacle. The race began from a standing start, uh, race long, torrential rain, never interrupted by a safety car. Unthinkable today. If modern day drivers were allowed to display their talents under those same conditions, who do we think would shine the most? Well, you know, Lewis Hamilton, obviously. I mean, look at his pole lap at the Italian Grand Prix, what, three years ago now, when he was, what, 1.2 seconds quicker than Max Verstappen on, to get the pole? Absolutely superb. Max, too. We've seen how good Max is in the wet, particularly in Brazil. Uh, really rate him. Charles, haven't really seen Charles, but I know he's going to be brilliant in the wet. And I've always had a suspicion, and well, he is, car control-wise, Carlos Sainz is really good in the wet, too. But we haven't yet really seen that come out, but I think um, eventually we will, and Carlos Sainz probably will will get in a great wet weather drive at some point in his career. So thank you very much for that, Diego, brilliant stuff. Um, just going back to the YouTube channel now, just to see you've got some questions coming in. Um, hi, Peter, thanks for this live show. Can every driver be labeled as manipulative or reflexive? How do you put every, how do you put every Formula One 2020 grid driver into that classification? <laughs> well, again, that's a pretty good it's a very good question, and again, I think some of we will kind of bleed it over to the next show because I don't want to spend too much time on it. But what we're talking about here are drivers that basically very reactionary and very reflexy and very very spectacular to watch. Therefore, and drivers who are warning the car and manipulating the dynamic energies before their inputs manifest themselves on the track, if you see what I mean. Sterling Moss was a classic example of a driver who could manipulate a car to do what he wanted it to do and never really looked out of control or as if he had to use his, his car control. He was always feeling the car, always feeling the inputs. I remember I drove with Sterling, and now we're getting on to the sort of my running order of the show, some Sterling um, memories. I drove up to Silverstone one year with Sterling when he was testing his um, Akai Audi BTCC car. And um, I remember talking to Sterling about that, and he said, oh, well, you know, of course, braking old boy is the most important part of the whole thing, the entry to the corner. The exit is you know, fairly straightforward. And I said, yeah, but it's not about just late braking, is it? He said, no, oh, no, not at all. No, it's, and it's, it's a, it, and I won't do any more stuff. <laughs> uh, it was about creating this platform, which enables you to be able to manipulate the car to do what you want it to do. Typically, a reflexy, energizing driver will brake as late as possible, live with the nervousness of the car, and then try to find the earliest possible moment for getting onto the power. A manipulative driver will create a stable platform around which he can get the car to do what it wants to do or react to what the car is doing. If it's, if it's starting to understeer, create the stable platform that allows you then, 
perhaps to put on a little bit more steering lock as you're coming out of the brake pedal, things like that, things that Rob Wilson has talked about as well. It's all about managing the dynamic weight, this billiard table with the balls in the middle, just trying to keep them in the middle all the time by moving the, the table around. And that's, um, that's what Sterling said. And Jim Clark was exactly the same. He talks about that in his book, Jim Clark at the Wheel. He doesn't use the same phraseology, but he says for him, it's all about stability going into the corner, but he had this ability to go into the, what he called the apex earlier. And that was extending the straight in such a way that you're coming out of the brakes and loading up the steering in a very, very supple way, which again is part of manipulation of warning the car. Of the current drivers, I would say, I mean, the, the, the two drivers who are reflexy in my view are obviously reflexy, Roman Grandjean and um, Carlos Sainz. Carlos Sainz more, I think, in great contrast to Lando Norris, who looks to be pretty manipulative from what I can see. I haven't really seen enough yet. I don't think any of us have to say that that's categorical. But I think that's, that, that's an interesting contrast between those two. Lewis for sure is manipulative and, and that's why a lot of the time people say, and they have been saying it very recently, a lot of interestingly in impressive people have been saying, well, you know, Lewis, I like to see him in a bad car. The Mercedes is such a great Grand Prix car. Of course it is, but he makes it look a really great Grand Prix car with the way he drives. And, and a lot of that is lost because we don't see the footwell area stuff and we don't see what he's doing with the, with the pedal pressures brake and throttle against steering load. And those are the critical things. It's the ratio of the throttle, the brakes against the steering that is so critical. But Lewis is very good at feeling the car. And, and it's easy to say that, but when I, when I say feeling the car, what I mean is allowing the car to tell him what's happening by not covering it with so much energy that it's all just reflexy stuff. Going back to Sterling, he always said that, he said to me always, that fear was never, or bravery was never a part of his racing life. The minute he felt that he had to be brave on any corner with any car, he knew that things weren't right and he had to get them to the point where everything was anticipation and everything was happening as it should happen in slow motion. That was the only way Sterling ever wanted his driving to be. And most of the time he created that. Um, so they're the two obvious. I think, you know, I can't say that all the others are manipulative. I certainly cannot say that. But certainly the two standout reflexy drivers for me are Carlos Sainz and Romain Grosjean. Um, I'm just trying to think if there are any others that I should be mentioning at this point. You know, guys like Sergio Perez, interesting example. I, I think he's quite manipulative, but he's also a little bit, blunt in a couple of other areas like he's not very good when he has understeer to get out of that situation a bit like Yano truly a truly manipulative excuse the pun a truly manipulative driver uses the car to cover all situations I think Jensen was a bit like that as well you know Jensen wasn't a great oversteer driver he couldn't really live with the back end that was that he probably felt was a bit required reflex reflexes and car control uh, if it was a flick oversteer crosswind situation jensen wasn't very good but a great manipulative driver can actually manipulate the car to combat that as well and that's the difference between lewis and a jensen you know we can go on about this for hours and i love talking about it i love thinking about it and learning about it and there are many more things we can learn from the 2020 formula one grid for sure when we start to watch the racing again this year another thing worth saying on this and i'll move on to the next point is that to make these sorts of calls and they're not judgments they're just observations it's the difference between saying a tennis player is a serve volleyer or a baseliner it's that it's not criti it's criticism as such it's just description of what they're doing but to make those calls you've got to be able to watch the drivers on corners where you can actually see some differences and that's a problem, there's a twofold problem today. Not many corners exist on which that is the case, first point. And secondly, even if they do, it's very difficult to get in the right position to see that. Now, I'm quite lucky because I have a pass that enables me to get one of these tabards and I can go out and watch on the circuit. But there are, not, there are some tracks where I just don't even bother because I know I'm not going to find a place 
um, where I can actually see anything going on. Actually, Austin is a good example of that. Other places like uh, the much missed Sepang, there were about nine corners you could go to at Sepang and see these very subtle differences, which is why I really missed that circuit. So that's one thing. The other point is I think on television, it's very difficult to see that as well for shortened lenses. Quite often they'd pan shots, quite often they move with the car as they're going into the corner. You've got to be able to stand on the entry to a corner, like say cops, the old cops, not so much the new cops, but the, the old cops, and look at the way a Yano truly turned in compared with a Ralph Schumacher. There was definitely a difference. And those, th or a Fernando Alonso, and you could see that on the entry to cops. You couldn't see it if you're standing in the middle of Beckett's, sort of watching them side view, going through really quickly, impossible to see anything there. So you've got to be able to find the right, the right places to watch, and you've got to have the right sort of circuit as well, none of which is easy these days. And that brings me back actually, I don't know why, but it brings me back to this e-racing because another thing that struck me about e-racing was that I couldn't actually tell any differences between all those cars out there, particularly in this Aussie V8 race. And I think it was the case of the Formula One I was watching too. You can't see any of these inputs, which is why I'm saying maybe if we saw them actually driving, we would perhaps be able to marry some of the steering input with what we're seeing on the circuit. That's why I go on about that, really. <laughs> Hope all that makes some sense. Um, lots of questions coming in. Thank you very much. Um, so that was that was uh, Diaz, no, oh, 10 cylinder in Spanish, I think. Bronco Billy, Peter, what was your first memory of Formula One? Well, you know, and I'm not saying this because uh, of what's happened this week and of where I want to go next uh, with, it, with our first video. Um, I'm saying this because it's true. In 19, you all know how old I am, so I don't care, but talking about years now. In 1962, and we'd, we'd emigrated as a family to Australia in 1957 when I was four, and we went by ship, mega thing. No cruising for me. I like A to B ship travel, thank you very much. I know it doesn't exist today, but I loved it. No jet lag for apart from anything else. And imagine today you'd have Wi Fi and everything else. It was just so cool. Anyway, 62, we came back to England because um, my dad got two months leave, I think it was. Yeah, two months. And we came back and we stayed in Dolphin Square on the embankment. So now I'm nine years old. And my dad, my family in general, my dad particularly loved point to point horse racing. Never betted. Well, if he did, it was 10p here, 10p there. And he hated the days when, sadly, a horse hurt itself. But he loved the rural richness of point-to-point -point national hunt, horse racing. And as indeed does Sally Swart, Sally Stokes. They've got the same, I noticed when I went to Sally's house not so long ago, she's got the same Munnings painting of Cheltenham uh, on her wall that my dad had. Anyway, I divert. Um, so it's 62 and I'm in my cousin's Morris Minor and he's got a transistor radio and a leather cover with an aerial which he, and he's got the aerial on the roof on the side roof to open the side window and the aerial sort of clipped onto the edge there the window ledge and he's got the leather transistor radio and we're driving to some or back from a horse race somewhere which I found really boring I gotta tell you I'm not into horse racing at all that's just me and um and then they broke to go to Robin Richards I think it was Robin Richards who had a radio report from Goodwood Easter Monday Goodwood and it was about Sterling's accident. I can remember it as clear as day, the voice of, the, of Robin Richards, I think it was Robin saying, uh, but the race was marred by a serious accident involving the British racing driver, Sterling Moss, who hit the bank extremely hard in his Lotus and was taken away in a critical condition. I remember hearing that and I remember thinking, what is this all about? And obviously it wasn't the accident as such, it was that there was this thing called motor racing going on and people were doing this. And the next thing I knew, my godmom um, had said, because you've lived in Australia, Peter, we haven't given you any birthday presents. So you can choose whatever you like. We're gonna to go to Hamley's tomorrow and you can choose whatever you like. And I got myself a Scalextric set. And from the Scalextric set onwards, the white picket fence, the KLG signs, the little pits, the Ferrari shark nose, the Cooper Climax, the smell of the plastic, the smell of the track, everything about it, the hand controllers, I was in love. And that was the moment really that motor racing became the only thing I ever thought about. And then of course it was a question of translating that into real life. And my dad 
um, encouraged. Well, he, he they went to horse racing. I encouraged him to start going to Warwick Farm where the motor racing was, and it took off from there. And I remember the first book I ever got was the 1962 edition of Automobile Year. I can still remember the smell of the pages, the look of every photograph in there. I must have read that book 150 million times. I knew every word of it. I just love that book, Automobile Year Number 10, Graham Hill on the front. And um, then I bought Jim Clark's book, from Jim Clark from the Wheel in 1964, about the 63 season, and uh, you know, the rest is history. Really. So that was a <laughs> long explanation. Anyway, time, plenty more. We will try and get through everybody, but time, I think, to um, to have a look a bit more at Sterling. And I'd like to look at Sterling's accident, that last race at Goodwood on Easter Monday, because there's never really been, and we'll never know exactly what happened that day. Sterling doesn't know. There was, I, I did talk to him about it relatively late in his life. And he there was talk about Graham Hill, uh, who was um, leading the race and went on to win the race. And Sterling, just to put you this into context, Sterling had made a couple of pit stops and was by now a lap or two behind. But um, we should remember that the Snetterton Formula One race held just a couple of weeks before, the same thing had happened. Sterling had been on the pole with the what was now the UDT Lastel Lotus 1821 with the V8 engine and the six-speed Colotti gearbox, significant. And he'd had a quite a lot of trouble in that Snetterton race with the throttle and a little bit of gear change issues as well, made a couple of pit stops. And then halfway through the race, decided that for the crowd and for his own benefit, he would just put on a demonstration of very fast lappery. And he went out, set fastest lap and was just brilliant to watch. So absolutely for sure, that's exactly what he was doing at Goodwood on Easter Monday. He'd had a couple of pit stops. He came out of the pits. There was no way he was ever going to win that race, but he was driving flat out to put on a show for the crowd, to do a demonstration, if you like, of high-speed precision driving. And Graham Hill was leading the race. And Sterling um, was catching Graham as they went into Ford Water and then the next right, which is where he went off the road. And, and as I understand it, Graham didn't, know that Sterling was there. And why would he have thought that anybody would be going quicker than he anyway? He was leading the race. And Sterling went to go down to the inside of Graham. Graham didn't see him, saw he was probably going to have a chop and then went to the left as they're going into the right-hander. And at that moment, the left rear tyre of Sterling's uh, Lotus went over the edge of the track. And there was a bit of a sort of dip between the edge of the track and the beginning of the grass. And the tyre sidewall sort of got caught, if you like, against the edge of the track. And it was difficult to get the car back on, at which point he just went onto the grass, eased the steering, but it was wet grass, and then he hit the bank hard. But there is one other thing as well, and we'll get onto that after I show this video, because I spoke to another driver who was in that race, and he has something he can add, some texture to what I've just described. We'll get onto that in a minute. The video, which we're about to see, not just yet, is, again, to put it into context, Sterling, you know, for me, it was always interesting, the Sterling Moss v. Jim Clark, because if we're looking at great drivers in the history of the sport, both of them have to be up there. And there was this slight overlap period in 19, effectively through from 1960 through to obviously 62. But 61, back end of 61, Jimmy Clark was the factory Lotus driver. Sterling was in the Lotus 1821. He was always in an older car than Jimmy, but there were occasions when they really had some close racing, Snetterton being a good example. Sterling got the pole, Jimmy was P2. Interesting. They'd done the South African series. Well, Jimmy had done the whole series. Sterling hadn't done every race. Jimmy won three of those races. Trevor Taylor won. Sterling had two seconds. So in South Africa, Jimmy beat Sterling, if you like, one-on-one. -on -one. But then Sterling was in an older car and nothing like as quick as Jimmy's Lotus 21 in a straight line. Then they went to Brussels and again, it was close. Jimmy was very quick, but so was Sterling. And there was every reason to feel that Sterling Moss was at that point, even though Jim Clark was really on the rise and about to win his first Grand Prix, that Sterling Moss was quicker and he was the master. And so we came to Easter Monday, Goodwood. And an interesting weekend because there were three Formula One races that weekend. There was one the day before, which was the Lavant Trophy for four-cylinder Formula One cars. 
there was the race in which Sterling had his accident. And then simultaneously on that Monday, there was the Po Grand Prix. And you know what? It never struck me until this week, just looking at the results, that a lot of people say, isn't it a shame that Jim Clark didn't do BOAC 500 in 68? He could have done it with Alan Mann, but he did the Formula 2 race at Hockenheim. You know what? It's such a shame Jim Clark, it's such a shame Sterling Moss didn't do the Po Grand Prix that year because the race was won, would you believe, by Maurice Trantignant in the car that Sterling would have raced, the Lotus 1821. Uh, with Ricardo Rodriguez second and in a shark nose Ferrari. But Jim Clark was in that race. He retired. There was more starting money at Poe, which is why Lotus went there. But Sterling wanted to be at Easter Monday Goodwood because it was part of the whole British motor racing tradition. So this is a very short AP video. Let's just have a quick look at that now. Um, and I'll just talk you through that. So there's Sterling. This is just the beginning of it. It's winning, of course, in 1960-61 in the uh, Berlinetta 250 GT Rob Walker Ferrari, synonymous with Goodwood and, and Sterling Moss. And doesn't he look cool there after the race? And then it quickly goes to the 62 Easter Monday race. We see them pulling away from good. There's Sterling in that 1821. And that's the debris as he hit the, the bank. You see how the car just bananaed that space frame chassis. There's Sterling. And then this video is amazing. This video then goes to the Odium Petty Sessional Division notices where Sterling has to appear in court. Uh, this is, I think this is 64, maybe 65, there he's in his Mustang, for um, a speeding offence. I was talking to Nigel Ro Roebuck about this. He thinks it was in the Mersey Tunnel and it was in a, <laughs> it was in a Triumph Herald convertible. Uh, I wish it was something more dramatic. But anyway... Um, there's Sterling, um, and we think that's his second wife, Elaine Barbarino, a bit more on her in a minute, as they go in, lots of press outside. I just thought this was interesting because never really seen this before, and it just gives an idea of how dapper and together Sterling was. This is, what, three years after his retirement and his accident, and um, he looks a little bit as if he's got a fine there, but he probably will pay it, and speeding is not good. So thank you very much to AP for that. Um, yeah, I mentioned Elaine, his second wife there. Interestingly, that, that marriage didn't last very long, although I think there is a daughter from that. Um, but she then went on to marry Michael Taylor. And Michael Taylor is the Lotus 18 driver who had a massive shunt in practice of the 60 Belgian Grand Prix, literally a few minutes before Sterling. He had, I'm gonna say it was something to do with a steering arm brake going into Bernanville and massive shunt. It was his first World Championship Grand Prix and was thrown out of the car, uh, a long way from the car, very, very seriously injured. He's in a wheelchair for a long time after that. And then literally a minute later, Sterling had his shunt when the left rear wheel came off the Lotus 18 and had his shunt as well. And of course, all the ambulances and all the attention was all on Sterling. <laughs> Michael Taylor was over there as well, uh, getting very much secondhand attention and treatment. Uh, so kind of ironic, weird, strange that um, Elaine went on to marry Michael Taylor when, when she split up with Sterling. Um, and so I was thinking about this and I, and I noticed that Keith Green finished seventh in that race at Goodwood and finished fourth the day before. In fact, Keith had had a very good run uh, at the beginning of 62 in his father's Gilby. I say his father, Sidney Green, was a well-known racer in the 50s and, and 60s, had a great company, Gilby Engineering, built a Formula One car for his son, Keith, who he really rated. And Keith, towards the back end of 61, 62, was really getting it together. He had three fourth places in a row and he went on to finish third in the Naples Grand Prix and he was at Goodwood on Easter Monday. He was in that race with Sterling and he was going down the pit straight as Sterling rejoined the race from one of his pit stops, literally the lap that he was to leave the road. And Keith um, remembers catching Sterling a little bit through the first corner at Goodwood, as you would, because he had the momentum and Sterling was just accelerating. But as they came out of that corner, Sterling started to pull away with the B8 engine. Keith just had the four cylinder Climax engine in the Gilby. And Sterling goes into Ford water and goes beautifully into Ford water. And then he remembers seeing Sterling with this left rear wheel just over the edge of the tarmac and thinking, oh, he's gonna have a problem there. 
And sure enough, he, over, over the corner of his eye, he sees Sterling going off into the into the bank. And then the next lap, he knew there was obviously something very serious. But uh, in talking to Keith, he also had this six-speed Colotti gearbox on the Gilby. It was a, a relatively new gearbox, actually engineered by Alf Francis, Sterling Moss's famous mechanic. But at this point, Alf was very connected in Italy, and he was helping Colotti with the addition of this additional speed, this extra speed, making it a six-speed rather than a five-speed. And Keith said that was a terrible gearbox, and he had a lot of trouble with it, and the casing was not good. There were oil leaks from it. And he still thinks that probably there was some oil leaking from the casing on, on the Sterling gearbox onto that left rear, which might which would have added to the whole situation. So before we go any further, I actually recorded um, just a little bit of my telephone conversation with Keith, who's fit and well, great guy, you know, former Brabham team manager, ran the Williams touring cars, won Le Mans, I don't know how many times, brilliant driver manager. Um, and here's Keith Green now. Let's just listen to him on this little bit of extract from the phone call I had with him. The Colotti box was a big mistake. It was a six-way gearbox, which is one of the first. It was with Al Francis and Colotti in Italy. If the casing starts to crack, which it regularly did. In fact, I had a almost permanent um, resid in aluminium plate, 16-gauge aircraft alley plate in the bottom of the gearbox because it cracked several times on me. I don't know if he lost oil, uh, which of course could have could have been another reason. A spray of oil onto the left rear tyre, loaded going into the right hander, and just slipped off the edge. For whatever reason, either himself as, a, as an error, or because there was a selection problem and he realised it would lock it, so he threw the clutch or something, that made it impossible for the car to react, and of course the load effectively loaded wheel had no grip on wet cross. Yeah, so Keith Green there making it pretty clear that that six-speed Colotti gearbox was not a great piece of engineering and that there could well have been an oil leak as well as perhaps that confusion with Graham Hill. Um, I think it's also worth making the point that Sterling was always, you know, if, if there was some un misunderstanding with Graham, Sterling never thought it was deliberate and it was just one of those things. And, and it was interesting that Graham, after that accident on Easter Monday, having won the race, spent a lot of time saying, I'm just so sorry. I'm so sorry about what happened. Um, so I guess we'll never really know exactly, but that was the, that was the accident that ended Sterling's career and of course changed motor racing forever. It was the end of an era, not only um, of Sterling's um, racing activities. And we'll be talking more about Sterling for sure as the year goes on, because I'm not going to let him go away into the, uh, the memory banks and just lock him away. AP, I'm sure, will will be able to give us a lot more access to some of their archives and we can look at some of Sterling's great wins as these shows continue. Now, let's move on to a few more questions. Um, Michael Welch says, Moss Monaco 61. I think that's what you're saying there, Michael. Yeah, I mean, one of the great all-time wins when he used the traffic to beat Richie Ginther in the shark nose Ferrari. Something you can't do today because... The slower cars are told to move over, you get these lights in the cockpit. But in those days, the traffic was part of the art of winning a Grand Prix or managing the traffic. And that's what Sterling could do so beautifully. He would pass a car at exactly the right moment, knowing that it was going to be the least downside for him and the maximum downside for Richie Ginther. And that's how he won that Monaco Grand Prix, really, apart from obviously everything else. And the one Sterling, um, I can't tell you whether it was 61 or 60 at Monaco, but definitely he managed to get himself a date by hand signaling a very good looking girl who was watching at the station hairpin on the outside of the station hairpin. And without actually using any words at all, just hand signals, six o'clock, seven, eight, whatever, thumbs up, he got the date at the hotel, driving the, uh, obviously the slowdown lap was a little bit going on, but um, during the race, he was able to do it as well. So that was one of Sterling's great achievements, I think. Um, he'll go down in history forever for that. Uh, I'm sure that's going to bring up a lot of other questions about other drivers who did similar things in different ways, James Hunt particularly, but we won't go down that path at the moment. Um, 
Rasmus Breck, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Rasmus, sorry, Rasmus Breck, uh, South African or Dutch maybe. Hi, what do you think Williams need to do to get back to fighting at the top? Well, you know, it's a, <laughs> with this being Sir Frank's birthday, and I've got this thing where I try, if I, yeah, I, you know, I just, it's impossible, but if I haven't got something positive to say, I try not to say it at all. Um, and, you know, we all love Williams, don't we? We all want them to be back and we all want them to succeed. I think they've got two really good racing drivers now, a really good driver pairing. I think George Russell, Nicholas, Nicholas Latifi is really, really good, particularly as Nicholas is very helpful too on the financial side. But he's there, I mean, to me, he's a very talented guy as well with a great personality. And I think um, I think that's a great, I think that driver combination is worth probably half a second over some other teams that might have a better car. So I think we'll see them doing better this year because of how good those two guys are, particularly George, of course. I mean, he's sensationally good. and. And so there's that. That's the first thing. I think I'll have a better year this year than they did last year. And I think also because they were left in such a horrendous state when Lawrence Stroll left them and he'd been running the team, dare I say, into the ground. But, you know, shouting and screaming and worrying about whether your son's going to go well or not is not the way for a Grand Prix team to be getting out of bed every morning. It needs to be organic and it needs to be based on enthusiasm for racing. And um, it takes a long time to get over that. I think a lot of damage was done there. And I think that, um, you know, I don't think there's been confidence given to drivers when perhaps it should have been. I don't know. I'm kind of rambling now because I, I know what I would do if I was in there running it, but I'm not. So I don't want to say any much, much more than that, really. I think they'll go better this year. And I think that's something that we should be reasonably happy about. Won't be where they should be, but it's pretty good. Um, in your opinion, this is from David Miras, how should the 20, 2005 US Grand Prix have unfolded? What did you do once the cars came to rest 15 years ago? <laughs> um, well, for me, it was actually quite an enjoyable race to do on TV because it was endless interviews and discussion. So <laughs> I quite enjoy all that. Um, I think they should have put a chicane in and, you know, I think that was, of course, it wasn't a great solution because the circuit would have been changed for the race. But at the same time, I think that would have been better than having six starters to a US Grand Prix in front of the fans. I think I think it's the least Formula One should have and could have done. And I'm still shocked that that didn't happen. I felt... Yeah, I always liked Michelin as a company. I kind of grew up with them with Pierre de Pasquier in 78. And I always liked their ethos of incredible technology. But they, you know, they caught a cold that weekend with the bank corner. No question about that. But I think Formula One should have worked around that. Instead of which, they made, they made it look like a nonsense for the fans. I think they made Michelin look terrible in America. And it's no surprise that you know, 18 months later, Michelin pulled out of the sport. I mean, what we'd give now for Michelin to be in Formula One, but in my view, they never come back because of the way they were treated, not only at Indy, but also um, back end of 06 when Ferrari accused them of, Ross Braun and John Todd, of um, deliberate flagrant cheating. So that was the dual compound thing. So, yeah, very sad. I hate thinking about Indy 05, actually. Um Fludo won. I was thinking only about that billiard ball example yesterday. Wow. Well, there you go. Kindred spirits. Um, thanks again, Peter. My question this week, Formula One cars, do you have a personal preference on the era that you felt best suited showcase the top drivers of the said era? This is from Ryan International. I don't really know. I think, I think, you know, I think every era has its great drivers. And I think all the great drivers have been able to show that haven't they, uh, at some point or another during that era? I think I think that the, the more difficult thing is getting into Formula One. I think that's still one of the great things I dislike about our sport, that you can be a very good, young, talented driver. And if you don't have the right people around you or the right brakes at the right time, you'll never get a chance to show your ability. And I think that is terrible. And I would have hoped that in the 2020s, 
Formula One would have done a better job now of resolving that situation. Now, of course, there are great examples of drivers who have made it because they've convinced the right people, Charles Leclerc, Lewis Hamilton, two obvious signs, I'll bash the mic then, sorry about that, and Lewis Hamilton um, being two obvious examples, but they're just two examples. There are plenty more Lewis's and Charles out there, but and Max's, but are they ever? Are we ever going to see them? Probably not. And that is something that I've always said. The teams, the team, each Formula One team is in itself effectively a management agency for drivers, a bit like IMG or the other big sports management agencies are for tennis, golf, and other sports. In in motor racing, the power is with the teams. That's where the that's where the money is. That's where the power is. And the teams should have really, really good driver management systems that not only allow them to sign up a driver and if they like him, put him in the sim, and but actually help that driver go out and raise money in a really constructive way rather than just bringing him up and doing, you know, stuff in the gym and working in the sim. It needs to be more than that. They need to be given real help to go out and find these ridiculously large sums of money to do just Formula 3. You know, how do you, if you don't have the backing of, Ferrari or Red Bull or I don't know, McLaren in the Lewis days, how do you raise 1 million euros for an FIA Formula 3 budget when the TV is negligible and the exposure is negligible? How do you do that? You can only do that if you can do it on the back of a Formula 1 operation and you're going into meetings, you're doing proposals with the Formula 1 team really helping you with everything. And I, you know, I would love to see that happen. I really don't hope it does. But as for drivers in eras, I think the eras have always produced the great drivers, I think. Um, I'm thinking of starting a podcast about Formula One cars. Good. That's uh, Mr. Diesel Akius. Good. Go for it. Brilliant. Um, another show, Peter. What's the greatest overtake in motor racing in your view? PK on Senna, Hungary 86, uh, Mansell uh, 93, Lion Dyke on Mansell, Indy 593. Um, nah. I think, you know, it's hard to beat Nigel at Silverstone 87, isn't it? That was, you know, Nelson Piquet had already uh, already knew about Nigel in 86 at Brands Hatch. He knew what Nigel could do if it was a straight race between the two of them and they were on home soil. So Nelson had 12 months notice of what was about to happen at Silverstone. And Nelson Piquet is pretty good. Um, he says, of course, I'm being facetious, of course he was good, three times world champion. And, you know, there was every reason for Nigel not to pass Nelson or take him out. And he didn't either. He passed him and he passed him beautifully in one of the most amazing passes I think we're ever going to see. It was a double dummy. Of course, I think Mika on Michael at Spa too. That was beautiful in its execution, in its accuracy. And the fact that it was Michael with all the stuff that he had with him at that point, the baggage, um, you know, the thing with Coulthard off the line in the French Grand Prix earlier in the year and, and Mika being the driver he was just so pin sharp. That was spectacular as well. Um, I didn't see much of it, but I'm assuming that Jim Clark's drive in the 67 Italian Grand Prix, I see much of it on TV, was pretty good as well. I mean, he was a lap behind the field and he was leading the race with about four laps to go. So some pretty spectacular passes there, I would have thought. I don't know. Um, you know, Nigel was pretty good, I think, at overtakes. Landak on Nigel. I don't actually remember that. I remember Nigel at Indy in qualifying, how good he was. But I'm sure Ari was mega. I've got to tell you about Ari. Well, in 93, I went to America and um, to have a look around. We just won the World Championship in 92. So I kind of took a year off to go to America. Uh, not because Nigel was doing it necessarily, but of course I wanted to see how he was going to get on. But I just wanted to see America as well. And we did a lot of traveling around, Gettysburg and everything else. But um, I ended up at Texas Motor Speedway. And it was like a Thursday, which is, I think it's, it was a very short high banked oval. And Lion Dyke was there in the car that um, Mo Nunn was running. And it was these were this was 93 when they were unbelievably quick, methanol, fumes, the whole thing. And I was watching at the top of the banking, it was just me, empty circuit and Lion Dyke going around. And I'd never ever seen anything so quick. It was just eye-wateringly quick. It was ridiculously quick. Um, the smell, the noise, the speed. 
I think he was doing something like 245 or something ridiculous. And I don't know. Ari's a great guy. Very, very nice man. Known for a long time and pff, took the old hat off to him that day. That's for sure. Um, how do I rate Jensen in 09? This is another question. Uh, well, you know, he was very good the first half of the year, wasn't he? He struggled a bit in the second half. He did have a serious car advantage early on, but he maximised it, blew, blew Rubens away. I think that's what you have to say. In the same way, of course, that he was able to beat Lewis periodically at McLaren. Uh, you know, he was really good when he was on his day, Jensen. Uh, such a cliche on his day. When he had a car that didn't understeer or indeed have flick oversteer, he was brilliant. Um, more the flick oversteer thing. I think he could live with understeer pretty well. Um, but... I think with Jensen, the thing about Jensen is that a little bit like he's, Sergio Perez is sort of 70% of Jensen Button, um, and, but only in my mind, Jensen and Kimi have this ability, and I'm only quoting Rob now because it's such a great um, word picture of, it's as if the throttle is has some sort of string attached to the loaded rear on exit from the corner, and they're never, ever giving one ounce of energy on the right rear more than the right rear can take or the loaded rear can take. It's absolutely seamless, perfect use of power application. And that was Jensen's greatest quality, I think. And you saw that, you know, he was very rarely out of line. You very rarely saw him doing any of this. And of course, when he got all that downforce at the rear of the brawn, it was just like, this is Nirvana. And there we go. Um, so he maximized it. Second half of the year, it was a little bit of an uphill struggle. You know, the thing I think about Jensen, he never went well at Silverstone, did he? And I think that was always a bugbear for him. And I think when he again, even in the brawn, didn't have a very good year at Silverstone, um, I think that kind of coloured the second half of the year for him. I'd say, yeah, that's probably trite. But he did win the championship, and John was there to see it too, his dad, and what a great time that was. Great guy, Jensen. Big fan, and miss him, actually. Um, I'm going to do one more, and then we'll do a second vid. Uh, Flutter one, what do you think would be an appropriate budget cap? Huh. Uh, well, you're asking the wrong person about budget caps because I don't believe in them, actually. I think they're all nonsense because I don't think any of the t teams that are currently spending 200, 250, 300 are going to be in any way affected by a budget cap. I think they'll just get around it. So it's a nonsense thing to me. As I've said before, for me, the solution is to give the midfield the option of buying a Delara and a template engine and trying to create a sort of upmarket version of Formula 2 in the middle of the race. At the front of the field, you can still have your Red Bulls, your Mercs and your Ferraris, but the middle of the race, I think, should be F2 glorified, and that will only come if you go to a standardised car, or the option of buying a standardised car. Nothing wrong if you still want to do your own car, but there should be this car out there. That's what will bring the cost down. That, and the other thing is to, to hold the races at only two or three or four circuits in any given year in different continents, reduce the amount of traveling and overheads and the carbon footprint and everything else. That's the way I would go if I was running the sport. I wouldn't faff around with budget caps because it's impossible to police. And I think it's nonsense that myself. And I was part of that whole budget cap thing anyway, when we were trying to do USF1, we weren't trying to do a budget cap. We were just trying to do a relatively cheap Formula One team technology American, run it out of Europe. And I still think it would have been very successful. But the minute we did that and, and the authorities could see what sort of budgets we could run a team on or the, certainly build a car with, they immediately thought, oh, wow, isn't that amazing? Let's let's create a budget cap around that number. And it was, I don't know, $30 million or something. It's absolutely ridiculous. Um, so that's when that happened, I just thought, you know, something's wrong here. Um, okay, let's move on to the next thing because I love... Um, you know, I've been spending a lot of time, as you can imagine, going through the AP archives and looking for stuff that um, I've never seen before. Yeah, it's one thing to see them all in books, these black and white pictures, but actually to see them in life is a different thing altogether. And I love doing that. It's got to check. Well, it's seven o'clock already. Got to move on. Um, anyway, I came across the 64 Italian Grand Prix at Monza, which was, I think you'll enjoy it because it was... Ferrari had just won the previous two races. They'd won the German Grand Prix with John Surtees, the Austrian Grand Prix with Lorenzo Bandini. And now here they were at Monza, uh, two weeks after Austria, with an opportunity to win on their home soil with an Italian driver, don't forget, or with Big John, didn't really matter. And the World Championship was in their grasp. 
within a few races as well. So there was that element to it. We just had Honda's first appearance in Formula One at the German Grand Prix with their amazing, beautiful. I, a lot of people at the time said, well, it was not very good looking car. I love the functionality of that original 64 Honda. V12 engine mounted transversely in the back of the car. Can you imagine it? Ronnie Bucknam driving. Nobody had ever heard of Ronnie in this side of the Atlantic until the German Grand Prix. He crashed in the race, by the way. And... Um, and then there was Jimmy Clark, who was vacillating between the Lotus 25 and the Lotus 33, neither of which were as quick in a straight line as the Brabham. Interestingly enough, Dan Gurney was really quick in the Brabham that year. Graham Hill was very good in the BRM, Richie Ginther in support. And it was Monza. It was, you know, it was just one of those great classic Italian Grand Prix. So before, I, before we play the video, just a few points. You, it's, it's like all these things, it's quite quick, but it begins, this one begins actually with practice on Saturday. Now the practice on Friday was dry and then Saturday it rained. So, and, and they used to take times from both days to define the grid. So the grid had already been defined on Friday. Nothing happened on Saturday that affected the grid positions, which meant that some people were out of position, of course. Interestingly enough, also the race was supposed to be initially 320 miles, but then three weeks before the race, the Italian organizers, presumably realizing that Ferrari weren't going to be able to go the distance, reduced the race distance to 280, even though some teams like BRM had built cars with bigger fuel tanks and, and Cooper as well. <laughs> and also it was the first time at Monza when they'd started the race with a 323 grid pattern instead of 434, just to try and make things a little bit safer as well. And it was good that they did, because as you will see in this video, which is coming up in a second, sorry, I hit the mic again, Graham Hill stalls on the line, the clutch goes, and the field just swamps around him. I hate to think what would have happened if that had been a 4-3-4 grid. It's pretty wide at Monza, of course. There's lots of room to move around, but nonetheless, a nasty moment you'll see coming up for Graham Hill. So anyway, um, and the, one, one other final point I should make is two points, really. The Honda reappears here with fuel injection for the first time, and Ronnie Bucknam actually got it as high as fifth in the race before the thing retired blue. And Ferrari, on that Saturday, to please the crowd in the rain, for the first time ever, showed their new flat 12 Formula One car. Surtees and Bandini are in V8s, but they run the new flat 12 for the first time. And there is movie footage of that on this. That's why I love this video. You just see the car going past the pits, but it is the only pictures I've ever seen of that flat 12 at Monza. Okay, so here we go. 1964 Italian Grand Prix at Monza. So there's the pit lane on this wet Saturday. In the foreground, that's um, Giancarlo Baghetti's Centro Sud two-year-old BRM. There's Ronnie Bucknam in the Honda. You can see the transverse engine there. Lots of interest around him. Pretty cool guy, Ronnie Bucknam, actually. He looked um, good. Look, there's Innes Island pushing his BRP down the pit lane. Um, it's... There's Jimmy Clark in the uh, tr in the spare car. That's actually the Lotus 33, the car he doesn't race. The T means training. Dick Scammell and Colin Chapman next to the car. Jimmy looking a bit dubious as to whether he should give any laps to the 33 in the wet. He did. He did wet car. There is, um, these are the shots from the grandstand. That's uh, uh, Mike Halewood in the Parnell Lotus. And there is, that's the flat 12. No, no, sorry. That's the ATS. Coming up next is the flat 12. For us. Joe Bonnier in the Rob Walker Brabham. And I think the next shot is of the flat 12 Ferrari having its first outing. Yeah, there you go. Lorenzo Bandini in the flat 12 car, which was used later on in the year, but Surtees went on to win the championship with the V8. So now it's race day, sunny and dry on race day. There's Lorenzo tape over his nose in the V8 car. Beautiful. He has a massive dice with Richie Ginther throughout the race. Surtees yet to climb into his car. There's Jimmy in the 25 rather than the 33. Looking, uh, he's got tape on his forehead as well against the stones. Now watch Graham Hill on the left-hand side there at the front row. Dan Gurney's in the middle, Surtees is on the pole. Watch Dan Gurney. Uh, Graham Hill just goes nowhere, puts his hand up. And look at that. <laughs> ay, 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 ay. Anyway, nobody hits him and he gets out of the car and pushes everybody away because he has to push the car back into the pit lane. If there's any chance of getting him going again, he has to do everything on his own. And he's used to doing that because um, that's what happened. Before. He did that the following year, Monaco 65. Here we've got, um, that looks like Baghetti in the old BRM. That's the car Graham Hill won the 62 German Grand Prix with. Dan Gurney, this is the leading bunch. Gurney, Surtees, Clark, McLaren. They pulled away from the rest of the field. Um, big slipstreaming race. Oh, Mario Cabral spins the ATS. Did very well to qualify that car, actually. This is re-engineered by... 
Derrington and Al Francis. Jack Brabham, a bit lost in the midfield there, not going anything like as well as his uh, as his understudy, if that's the right word, Dan Gurney. Uh, Jack has an engine problem. Richie Ginther pulls out over the cement dust coming out of the parabolica. Big dice that revolve. Here's Surtees and Gurney. They swapped places 27 times before Gurney's engine went off and Surtees went on to win the race. And there you see the chequered flag coming down. Surtees, a brilliantly popular winner for the Italian crowd. And Bandini just pips Richie Ginther on the line, weaves across in front of him. Mauro Foggerio in the background talking to Bandini. Uh, and um, a lot of discussion after that race as to whether Bandini... Um, should have been penalised or something for his driving, and uh, but it wasn't. It was Monza, and he got third place for Ferrari. So um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed that. That was, um, you know, that was a big thing because from that win, Surtees then had the momentum to go on to. Uh, he didn't go well in Watkins Glen, but he won the clinch the championship in Mexico City when uh, Lorenzo took out Graham Hill, <laughs> the other contender. Um, Dan Gurney actually won that 64. Mexican Grand Prix, first win for good year, I think. No, he was on Dunlops. No, it wasn't. No, it was just Dan winning for Brabham. And of course, he'd won his, Brabham had won the first Grand Prix at French Grand Prix 64. So that was that. Um, let me just have a look at some of the other things that I wanted to talk about. Uh, yeah, just more questions, really. And that, just a few more, because it is after seven, and I know you all want to get going. Um, Jacques Villeneuve said that Olivier Panis was a threat in the 97 Formula 1 season had he not suffered leg injuries in the Canadian Grand Prix. Do you think he could have won the race and claimed more podiums? Well, you know, I think, you know, Olivier won in the wet at Monaco, didn't he, in 96. And I think at that moment, there was a lot of momentum with Olivier. I rated him, actually. Very good polished driver. And with the confidence of that win, I think... It's not surprising that um, he was considered to be a threat. But having said that, um, we'll never know. Bit of a try to answer, really, isn't it? But I think it's a way of saying Panis. If you look at Monaco, Beltoise, Panis, and you can say Keki Rosberg, I guess, in 83. Three wins in the wet, which were, what, were they peculiar to Monaco? Was it, what was that? But three wins that just happened and when they happened you thought wow why haven't these drivers won a lot more races Beltoise particularly 72 it was just amazing in the BRM as well and um, they always said that the reason one of the reasons he was so good was because in the wet Jean-Pierre who had a, quite a weak I think it was left arm from a motorcycle accident and the steering loads were so much less in the wet that all of a sudden it was equal territory for him um, but we'll get on to that I promise we'll do more on great wet races in a show coming up um, do you think Team Lotus could have won a championship again, even after Colin Chapman's death or passing? Um, you know what? I do. And there was a time when I, I'm not saying I could have done it, but I was, I did actually try to put a package together to buy Team Lotus and make it happen. And um, it didn't. And we did something else. We did Brabham instead. And that's another story. But at the, there was a time when Team Lotus had, and Peter Collins, my friend running it, Guy Edwards, who I'd introduced to Peter, one of the best sponsorship procurers in the business, David Hunt, same as Guy Edwards, really good guy, very good at finding sponsorship. Amongst drivers, they had Johnny Herbert, Mika Hakkinen, Julian Bailey, who I rated very highly as well. They had Honda engines. You know, um, they had good people. Um, Chris Murphy, very good engineer, as well as others. And yet it never all happened. And I'd like to think that it should have. And I still don't really know why it didn't. But I think that's a moment when Lotus could really have come back. If you think of the drivers they had and the way the team was. So, yeah, I think the answer is yes. Um, I think, you know, Peter War was uh, a, a, quite a difficult man. Obviously, very, very good racing driver. Won the Japanese Grand Prix, I think, in a Lotus 23 at one point. And um, very good team manager, very organised. Uh, but he wasn't very sympathetic and uh, he never got the best from Nigel, for example. And I think, you know, that was a shame 
because the, there was a time, wasn't there, when the when the Lotus Renault with Nigel and Elio was a very, very quick car. Obviously with Ayrton again, but there were different things beating Ayrton when he was at Lotus. So not quite the same opportunity, I think. I think that, that Mansell, D'Angelo's era, there could have been more success had the drivers been better managed, I think. That's what I would say to that. Um, hi, Peter. Do you like DRS? Would you prefer something only at the beginning of the straights Curves like instead of at the end, closer braking and wheel to wheel, no devices at all. No devices at all would be my answer. But that does mean to say the current cars with no devices at all. It would be very different cars with no devices at all. That would be my thing. I think we've got far too much arrow on the car. And I'd love to see much longer braking areas. And when I asked Ross Braun when they announced the 21 regulations, sorry, I've hit the mic yet again. That's the last time I've heard. Um, when I asked Ross Braun, um, when he was launching the 21 regulations in Austin, why they weren't doing anything about braking distances. He said, well, they're not significant in making the racing better. They're not a part of why we don't have more overtaking. I was about to say why, but I didn't get a chance. Because to me, we do need longer braking distances. And I think that would make it better for overtaking. And so that's where I would go. Obviously, this brake material would be the thing. So I know I don't like all those artificial things. I don't like things you can't really see or understand. And if you're in the grandstand, the racing should be pretty obvious. And if it's not obvious, because the DRS, all these things, then there's something wrong with it, in my view. It's all right on TV, but you know, it's not everybody watches it on TV. Um, oh, those shelves must have great treasures on them. What's the top three Formula One autobiographies you can recommend? <coughs> oh, three Formula One autobiographies you can recommend, not just drivers. It's interesting that one of the, thanks for that question. We'll draw a line there and I'll try and bring all the others <coughs> to next week. Um, yeah, lots of books there. Um, I love books. They've been a part of my life. Well, they've all, you know, not only motor racing books, I just love books in general. <coughs> Excuse me. Get my hand Water. Um, this is the last answer because we've got to finish. Ken Gregory wrote a great book. I think it was called Behind the Scenes of International Motor Racing. He was Sterling Moss's manager, but I couldn't put it down. It's beautifully written and it really makes you feel as if you're in the late 50s or the 60s or whatever the moment is that he's describing. And you always want to know what's going to happen in the next race, how they get to the next race, all the stuff that's going on. So I'd recommend Ken Gregory's book, Behind the Scenes of International Motor Racing. Absolutely. Jim Clark at the Wheel, I think, is still my favourite all-time motor racing book. It was written uh, in conjunction with Graham Gould, but Jimmy went through all the proofs with his own hand notes on everything. So there's, there's a lot of Jimmy Clark in there. There's two editions. One ends in 63 and another one has an, an additional section to the end of 65, which covers, therefore, his win in the 65 um, Indy 500. And for a third book... You know what? I've just been reading Sabine's book on Sabine Kem's book on Michael, and I can't believe how good it is. The photography is brilliant, but it's but the text section is really well written, and it's very Michael. It's really the Michael that I knew and loved, know and love, and explains a lot that I never knew at the time. So right now, off the top of my head, I would suggest you get a hold of that lovely book on Michael as well. Um, but again, <laughs> we'll start going through these books uh, as these shows develop over the year. To finish, I'd just like to close with um, a bit of video we've been given by Mercedes, which shows their wonderful um, CPAP, which is the continuous positive um, process for breathing, replacing ventilators. And they've been doing this now for a month or so. And it's got through the design, construction, and now dispatching stage to 10,000 uh, NHS suppliers in the UK. And probably this will go global. And I thought it was just so nice to see facilities like those at the Mercedes engine department being used for something so humane. And uh, so a little bit at the end here just to show you that. And uh, in the meantime, thanks for watching. Look forward to seeing you again next week.